Buenas son half a day from the island of Guam. You're listening to the second episode of Memoir Specifica, a podcast series exploring events, movements, and people in modern Micronesian history. I'm Tony Asios, the show's producer, and our anchor today is Dr. Vivian Damas. She's a retired professor of social work and women and gender studies at the University of Guam with an interest in community organizing, social justice, and social policy. March is Women's History Month in the United States, and March 8th was International Women's Day, a global celebration of women's achievements. So it's a great time to call to mind the contributions that women in Micronesia have made to local, Pacific, and U.S. history. Achievements which, if not documented or recorded, may be lost and forgotten. In this episode, Dr. Damas links the local and the global, the personal and the political, by bringing you the story of one Chamorro woman, Cecilia Cruz Bamba. For over three decades, Mrs. Bamba made many remarkable contributions to civic and political life on the island. But today, we'll focus on how she courageously took on the U.S. federal government on behalf of Guam's World War II survivors and their descendants by championing the causes of compensation for land claims and war reparations. Let's begin. On June 15, 1977, Cecilia Cruz Bamba appeared before a U.S. Senate hearing as president of the Guam Land Owners Association. This fledgling group, which she had organized the previous year, was seeking fair compensation for land taken from Guam's indigenous Chamorro people by the U.S. government from 1944 to 1963. Mrs. Bamba represented roughly 1,000 landowners who were increasingly frustrated with nearly three decades of federal inaction regarding these land takings. Immediately after its recapture from Imperial Japanese forces in 1944, Guam fell back under U.S. Naval Administration. The federal government claimed privately owned land was needed for strategic purposes. In the flurry and confusion of rebuilding a devastated island, and as America took the helm of a new world order, many in Guam were told there was little to no legal recourse to stop the land seizures. Some felt the land was owed to the military as a show of gratitude for liberating the island. But the 1970s marked the emergence of a Chamorro rights consciousness and advocacy in the context of land taking by the military. Now was the time, argued Mrs. Bamba, for the United States to finally do right by the people of Guam. She urged the senators to, quote, feel with your hearts, not just understand with your minds. At the time of her Senate testimony, Mrs. Bamba, affectionately known as Chilang, was the 43-year-old wife of a nine-term Guam senator and a devoutly Catholic mother of 10 children. Despite the veneer of filling traditional gender roles, in many ways, she challenged the expectations of the era about what a woman could not or should not do. Years of hard work and civic leadership earned Chilang a reputation as a serious business person and an exceptionally talented community organizer. As one of the 22,000 islanders who survived the two and a half years of brutal Japanese occupation, she knew firsthand about trauma and loss. She was six years old when the Japanese bombed Guam and took over the island. By age nine, Chilung had lost both her parents. Here is her eldest son, George Bamba. Her mother was eight months pregnant when the Japanese invaded, and then because she was had light skin, she was beaten in one of the checkpoints. Young Chilung witnessed this beating. That night, her mother hemorrhaged to death after giving birth to a stillborn baby. Then just before the war ended, her father was beheaded for helping an American pilot escape from a downed military plane. Knowing that nothing could bring her family back, Mrs. Bamba would eventually channel the sorrow towards efforts to return to the people of Guam what could be recovered. You know, and a lot of her feelings were actually born out of her experiences, especially during the war and after the war. And that's, that's what really drove her to uh, focus on the land claims. After reoccupying Guam in 1944, 
a massive military buildup was undertaken. About 40% of the island was requisitioned, including a 145-acre farm belonging to Chilung's father in what is now the site of the Naval Communications Station. That property was my grandfather's who raised cattle, processed copra, and it was a thriving industry or business before the war. After the U.S. invaded, they took, you know, they possessed the, the lands. They weren't even allowed to come into the property to retrieve any of their personal belongings. Uh, the house, I assume, was demolished, and everything that was there relating to her family was gone. In her congressional testimony, Mrs. Bamba recounted how she and her younger brother were fortunate to have been taken under the wing of her maternal grandmother. Several years had passed when a teenage Chilung learned that her father's land would soon be taken by the naval government. She sought its return but was told this was not possible. The family was eventually paid about $12 an acre, but once divided among all family members, there was little left with which to rebuild. Earlier this year, I spoke with Dr. Laura Marie Torres Souter, who devoted a chapter of her 1992 book, Daughters of the Island, Contemporary Chamorro Women Organizers on Guam, to Cecilia Bamba. But she took on a tremendous amount of responsibility at such an early age. And all of that trauma, rather than screwing her up, became the source of her strength. Of course, it was also personal for her because her family was a landed family and had lost land. But she really was truly an extraordinary person. She was 16 years old when she got married. She was a parent and a wife before most kids get out of high school. She was self-educated because she got married very early and was not able to go to college in the traditional sense of the word. At the same time, she was engaged in 30 or more organizations at any given time and had major roles in them. She was quite extraordinary because uh, she decided to share her life with the community while she maintained her commitment to her children and to her family. You know, she was not of the traditional image that one would have of women on Guam at the time, right after the Second World War and beyond. Long before Mrs. Bamba became a subject of Dr. Souter's research, Laura knew her as her mother's friend. Chilung eventually became a mentor and friend to Laura, as well as to a new generation of women leaders. When I came back from college, she had already been asked by the congressperson from Hawaii to see what she could do to facilitate preparation for the first U.S. Conference for Women in Houston in 77. So she gathered a group of women from Guam of all ages to participate in the planning and organizing of Guam's first women's conference in, in 75. So I participated with her in that, and she became my mentor for how to do those kinds of things on a community-wide level. And then we were both elected to represent Guam at the 77 Houston conference. So again, although I was the youngest of the delegates, she guided me and, and that's how we cultivated our friendship. In 1976, Mrs. Bamba traveled village to village in Guam, documenting the stories of land claimants. Dr. Souter was among the cadre of young women recruited as volunteers to complete this daunting task. That was during the time when we didn't readily have tape recorders, we couldn't use phones or anything like that, right? So we literally hand wrote these testimonies. A very laborious job and very often we were handwriting what the uh, claimants were, were saying in the way they were saying it, mostly in Chamorro, and then we have the job of translating and summarizing these testimonies. It was a very labor-intensive effort. Organizing the Guam Landowners Association and collecting the testimonies of so many land claimants was not only challenging, it was highly controversial. In 1977, George Bamba had just begun serving as staff assistant to Guam's delegate to the U.S. House of Representatives. 
He recalls how complicated the issue had become and how his mother squared her sense of gratitude toward the United States with her demands for justice. You know, the land claims issue for decades has been festering, uh, but they happened at a time when Guam was liberated, you know, from the Japanese occupation. So there was a sense of thankfulness or gratefulness for to the U.S. for liberating them. But then at the same time, you had this pent-up feelings of that something is not right with the way things had evolved since that time. You know, that's not to say that she believed that tomorrows were not patriotic because she strongly believed in that. But she also believed that people of Guam deserve to be treated a lot better just because they live on Guam or they're not, that they don't vote for the president, they, that they, there should be a different uh, set of rules. And uh, her feeling was that if what applies to in the U.S., you know, should also apply to Guam in terms of seeking redress for injustices, past injustices. You know, she was part of that generation that came out of the war where the military saved Guam. And so she was very pro-American in that respect. And this confused a lot of activists because those who spoke uh, on behalf of the federal government were not viewed as ideally suited to speak against the federal government or what the what the federal policy was. And yet it was because of the way that she presented herself as a loyal American, I think, that got her into some of the senatorial offices to make the case. So Viv, it was a very conflicting time. Because generations, one generation of, of Chamorros viewed reality in a very different way than the earlier generations did. And so there was a lot of locking horns, if you will, on issues related to land claims when it first started. But slowly and patiently, she went around the island and explained to landowners what was going on and that she was trying to advocate for their rights to get proper compensation for the lands that had been taken away. And she was able to create, to foster the establishment of the Guam Landowners Association. I was young at the time, uh, in my 20s, but I remember how contentious that was in the community. And yet she kept plowing on. There's one thing that is clear about Chilang Bamba. She was not a quitter. But conducting the research gathering testimonies, forming the association with legal counsel, and campaigning for support from approximately 30,000 Chamorros residing on the mainland were just the prelude. Now she would need to make her case to the federal government by lobbying members of Congress on their own turf. Loling, how did you see Chilung taking her remarkable organizing skills on the local level to her advocacy and negotiation at the federal level in Congress? She led with great diplomacy. People encouraged her here. We knew that she had that capacity to present herself in a way that she could get in the door. And she was able to get a largely male Congress to pay attention to her And as much as this goes against my grain, she strategically utilized her genteel manner. She was very well appointed. She always dressed up. Uh, She was a very lovely woman. And she used her her feminine approach to uh, soften the, the initial resistance so that they would listen to her. And so I became aware of that during her advocacy with the federal government that this was a skill that she was honing. I remember having a specific discussion with her. I said, how, how can you tolerate people just, you know, dissing you and, and ignoring you and trivializing the cause that you represent? How can you take that? And she said, you have to own your own cause. You have to own your own cause. And when you're engaged in advocating for it, you can't let what other people do contaminate your commitment to your cause. So that was something that was a powerful lesson for me. And the other thing that she would say is be persistent, be persistent, expect obstacles. She was realistic that way. On June 15, 1977, Cecilia Cruz Bamba made history by becoming the first Chamorro woman to testify at a congressional hearing when she spoke before the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources on House Resolution 6550, the Territorial Omnibus Act. Tucked into this bill was Section 304, 
introduced by Guam's delegate, Antonio B. Wanpat, which provided the remedial legislation required to right this historic wrong of military land seizures from Guam's people. Earlier in the hearing, the director of the Department of the Interior's Office of Territorial Affairs recommended that action on this issue be deferred because, quote, we do not have sufficient information by which to evaluate the magnitude of this problem. In his remarks, Delegate Wanpat pointed out that a bill introduced four years earlier in the House to address this issue failed because the military did not produce documentation of these land takings as requested. This time, however, Mrs. Bamba was determined to put a human face on the issue by speaking on behalf of 1,000 landowners and by presenting her own story and the devastating impact of loss of land. Dr. Souter, also known as Loling, recalls asking Chilung about speaking before the Senate committee. Well, I asked her, I said, is it scary to talk in the halls of Congress and to and to testify to this group of largely white males about an issue they don't care about. She said, whenever I got nervous, I would just think of the Tan Marias and the Tun Husseis who told their story. And that would give her a tremendous amount of courage. So I remember that part about her testimony. And she also made me aware of the idea of speaking beyond oneself. That she says, you know, Loling, when we speak in these forums, we're speaking for our whole people. Really, I think that that was the first time I understood what the personal is political meant. I became conscious of how you use your voice beyond the personal. Here again is George Bamba. It was a difficult decision. Taking it on so many decades after everything had been done, she basically had to re-educate the uh, current crop of political leaders in Washington as to what occurred. You know, a lot of them really weren't even aware. The bill passed, and that's what turned it around, because before then, there was all this skepticism about, well, you know, why are we reopening something that was supposed to be results? 20, 30 years earlier. So I think that's one of the best things that she ever did was she brought that to the surface and it finally bore fruit, but it took a lot of hard work and a lot of research. But once they're exposed, Congress had no other reason to object to it because they knew that something happened that shouldn't have happened. But I think uh, as we move along, we're seeing a greater understanding to the plight and the positions of the Chamorros are being taken by the federal government. And that's really one of the things that brought it to the forefront was, well, if this happened, then these other issues, such as war reparations, also happened. And, you know, there's another side to that story, not just the one that the federal government tells to everybody else in Congress. As a result of Mrs. Bamba's persistence and advocacy, the bill was passed, which provided $5 million for the initial phase of compensation. Eventually, an additional $37 million was awarded to individuals or their descendants who lost their land and were not fairly compensated. For my mother, uh, when the time for uh, receiving the payment for uh, land claims, uh, she did not accept it because she just felt that no matter what amount they offered, I mean, it was inadequate for what was taken away from them, not just their land, but their livelihood and the future. She didn't want to because that principle was so deeply embedded in her. And it's not to say that, you know, she's anti-federal government, because she's not. But it's just that as a tomorrow, what was done, and even the attempt to redress it, was inadequate to what the true feelings of what a tomorrow feels for land. In 1978, following the death of her husband, Cecilia Bamba decided to pursue her advocacy in another forum. She ran for and was elected to a seat in the 15th Guam Legislature, one of only three women in a 21-member body. It was during her one term as senator that she began the process of generating interest in the second cause to which she was committed. By the end of her tenure as senator, she had established the Guam Reparations Committee, a five-member commission charged with the task of investigating war claims. The goal was to secure compensation for those who suffered rape, injury, 
forced labor, internment, or similar hardships during the Japanese occupation of Guam. Since the 1951 treaty between the United States and Japan absolved Japan of future war claims, the U.S. was then expected to provide compensation for such claims. The Commission would document the atrocities suffered by 18,000 war survivors. By 1983, the Guam Reparations Act was first introduced in the U.S. Congress. But as that long fight in Washington was just beginning, Chilang was back in Guam battling cancer. Mrs. Bamba lost that battle on September 30, 1986, at the age of 51. Guam honored her with a state funeral, and Congressman Ben Bloss had the eulogy given by her son George read into the congressional record. How would you describe Cecilia Bamba's legacy? I think she showed by example how one person should really act to make a difference and to love your people to begin with, love the island, uh, be concerned with their concerns and their problems and their issues, and just find a way to be able to, you know, move forward and progress in, as a community, as a people. You know, plain and simply put, Viv, she put Guam land claims on the federal radar. And that's not an easy task. And I think that is truly her legacy, the land claims and war reparations. Even if they don't appreciate or like her style, I don't think anyone would deny that that's the legacy that she left for others to to pursue. Mrs. Bamba's legacy has been sustained by many, notably her oldest son, George, who served as a Guam senator for five terms and carried on her work to seek war reparations. He testified in Congress three times on that issue. In 2016, more than three decades after the Guam Reparations Act was introduced in Congress, President Barack Obama signed into law the Guam World War II Loyalty Recognition Act. It took another four years before survivors in Guam or their descendants would finally begin to receive financial compensation. By this time, less than 1,000 of 22,000 who survived the war were still alive. Chilang never lived to see the, the day that we would be getting these checks. And I remember when the elders were receiving their first checks, those old people who we recorded testimonies of, so many of them, so very many of them, when they were asked, had tears in their eyes and said, I see Tilan. They remembered her. And they remembered that it was because she never quit on them. She was present. She was present in their hearts and in their minds. And people knew that had she not broken that ground, they may not have been receiving that compensation that day. So that's her legacy. I really do consider her a Chamorro warrior. And I think that history will will recognize her for that. Vivian, thank you so much for sharing that history with us today. Let me ask, what made you decide to dedicate an episode of Memoir Specifica to Cecilia Bamba's life? You know, I feel the story of Cecilia Bamba is one of unwavering commitment. She really understood the importance of bringing carefully researched facts and the incredibly compelling stories of the people of Guam to the halls of Congress in pursuit of justice. As a social worker and as someone who uses narrative policy analysis, I believe in the power of people's stories and the importance of questioning the dominant narratives that prevail. Chilling got this. You know, she understood that these stories from Guam need to be recorded and woven into the broader American history of war and liberation and justice-seeking. But truthfully, you know, her list of achievements and overall influence on Guam is quite immense. This episode only touches upon some of the good work she did. I really encourage everyone to read Dr. Laura Souter's book, which I referenced in this episode, to get a fuller picture of this incredible woman and the other remarkable daughters of the island featured in the book. Tell us again the title of the book. 
It's Daughters of the Island, Contemporary Chamorro Women Organizers on Guam by Dr. Laura Souter. Chapter 4 is about Cecilia Bamba, and it's so aptly titled, Lady Extraordinaire. This book also provides us with a sense of Chamorro, her story, not history, and the changing roles and status of women in Guam. Excellent. So I mentioned in the show's introduction that March is Women's History Month and how important it is to document the contributions made by women in and of Micronesia. Otherwise, we really stand to lose major pieces of the region's historical memory. So tell me, does Guam remember the immense role played by Cecilia Bamba only a few decades ago? I think if you speak to people who were active in politics and civic life in Guam in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, she is much remembered. At any given time, I think she was doing the work of like 10 highly motivated people all combined. And what she was able to do in the last several years of her life, even while battling cancer, is inspiring. But sadly, as you and I discovered while researching this story, very little archival media relating to Mrs. Bamba survives. Yeah, it's true. We searched high and low for any audio, any video recording of her especially of her testimony to the Senate committee. But we just couldn't find anything. Uh, you know, from what we've been told, much of that media is simply lost to time, has been misplaced, or in some cases, a lot of it was probably damaged in typhoons over the years. Yeah, loss of documents from typhoons is a big problem. But what we were able to find speaks volumes, literally volumes, about her social impact. There are 49 boxes in the Micronesian Area Research Center at the University of Guam, filled with nothing but documents recording the testimonies of thousands upon thousands of Guam's World War II survivors. These are crucial documents, painstakingly collected by the Guam Reparations Committee that Senator Cecilia Bamba created. Not only do these documents help to tell our collective war story, but they played an instrumental role in convincing the U.S. Congress to finally honor their commitment to the people of Guam. And you know, land and environmental justice and the ongoing emotional saga of war claims remain big political issues even to today. Absolutely. Yeah, so we found 49 boxes of war claims, but almost nothing about Cecilia Bomber herself. It almost seems like her work, her legacy has outlived her own name in a way. You know, in a way that's probably true, but based on everything I've read and heard about Chilin, I think that's how she would have preferred it. Thank you for speaking with us, Vivian. Siju Usma Asi for having me. That concludes the second episode of Memoirs Pacifica. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll subscribe to our podcast and share it with friends. If all goes according to plan, our third episode will be available sometime in mid-April. Meanwhile, if any of our listeners with Roots on Guam happen to have any old videos, audio recordings, or photos of Cecilia Cruz Bamba, please get in touch. We'd love to take a look and possibly share them online. Until then, sign ma'ase and take care. Memoir Specifica is supported through grants from Humanities Guahan, the Northern Marianas Humanities Council, the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities, and the National Endowment for the Humanities.